Today's talk is titled The Umbrella Cover Museum Celebrating the Mundane to be delivered by Nancy Three Hoffman. The talk covers the following principles. Principle four, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And principle six, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Nancy Three Hoffman, yes, her middle name is the number three, is music director of One Island Family, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Key West, Florida. Key West is where she met Jan Colner, me, when they worked together in the orchestra on a production of Pippin. Nancy is also founding member of the Casco Bay Tumblers Klezmer Band, playing Eastern European Jewish folk music. Nancy Three founded the Maine Squeeze Accordion Ensemble, also based in Maine. In addition, Ms. Three is the founder, director, and curator of the Umbrella Cover Museum, which holds the Guinness World Record for the most umbrella sleeves. She sings in 25 languages and has performed in a dozen countries. Her time is split between Key West, Florida and Peaks Island, Maine. We are happy to have her today zooming in from Key West. Nancy. First, I really want to say thank you to Jan for inviting me and to all of the people that have been helping to set up this um, service and talk for me today. I always love connecting with Jan, so this was a great excuse to do it. And I thought I would start with a song. I've strapped on my accordion. And this is a song that introduces you to my museum of umbrella covers. Come look at the umbrella covers. They come over land, over sea. They're sure to impress and amaze you. Their beauty and diversity. Umbrella covers, those things that you lose when it starts to rain. Umbrella covers, we all celebrate the mundane. Their curator is Nancy Hoffman. Her middle name is number three, that's me. She's gathered some 2,000 covers from people like you and like me. Sing along. Umbrella covers, those things that you lose when it starts to rain. Umbrella covers, we all celebrate the mundane. They come from a place called Peaks Island. It's in the U.S. state of Maine. Along with the Guinness World Record, we all shout out, long may they rain. Umbrella covers, those things that you lose when it starts to rain. Umbrella covers, we all celebrate the mundane. That's a theme song I wrote myself, you could tell. And of course the tune is My Body Lies Over the Ocean, which I found is one of the most internationally known songs in the world. So before I start my slide presentation, I just want to tell you that it's true. It's just the sleeves, just the pockets, the sheaths, those little slip covers, cases that come on umbrellas when you first buy them. And most people do not know what to do with them. They get lost, they get thrown in the closet, they get dropped on the ground. Very few people use them religiously. Very neat people, I have to say. And very few people throw them out right away. So I just want to take a quick poll while you're in uh, this view. How many people think they might have an umbrella cover lying around the house or the car somewhere? So I see two, three, four, five. So I'd say a good half maybe of the group that's out here maybe not quite of course I don't know how much it rains in Cambria but normally I'd say 70% of people do not use their umbrella covers but don't know what to do with them and that got me thinking so I'm gonna now share my screen here and let's take a trip we'll take a trip to a little island off the coast of Portland Maine 
And we're going to get on the ferry here at the Casco Bay Lines Terminal in Portland. We're going to take about a 15 to 20 minute ride over Casco Bay. And it's a little foggy, misty today, but that'll burn off quickly, especially because it's summertime. You can see some houses dotted along the coastline. And here we are at the dock on Peaks Island. And I'm going to show you a little video of coming in to Peaks Island. A lot of tourists today. There's the main street going up the hill. You can rent a kayak here at the little beach. There are a couple of inns, very few places to stay now but Airbnb. And off in the woods is where this year I had the Umbrella Cover Museum. More about that later. But normally, you'll see this is um, another view of the island, of the bay and a typical house. This woman is a British magistrate, Philippa Hopkins, with her cup of tea, and you can't quite see it, but she has a little black umbrella cover there with a story that she's donating all the way from England to my museum. And let's take a peek. There it is, the world's only umbrella cover museum. And it's a pretty unassuming building on the main street of this little island. So I started thinking about umbrella covers one day when I cleaned out my closet and I found a few umbrella covers and they were just lying around, but did I throw them out? No. I started wondering whether anyone ever used their umbrella covers and if so, why, just what was going on with umbrella covers? So I started asking people. And this is how many I have now. They all, so many people have given me their umbrella covers that I had a huge collection. Well, it's taken 26 years. This was 25, 26 years ago. So I started asking people for their umbrella covers and they would hand them to me. I put them on my kitchen wall, including the story that went with them. The first person was my friend Becky from Miami, Florida. Here she is with a donation ready to go. And she also gave me one of her favorite colored umbrella covers off of a duck handled umbrella because she's a birder, she's an Audubon member. And she said, I took the umbrella with me, but I left the cover at home on a trip to Nassau. When I got to Nassau and it started raining, I realized I had left the duck at the dock. So the umbrella was long gone and she gave me the umbrella cover. So that was the first. And I always then ask people, what happened to the umbrella? Where did you buy it? Did you keep the cover for a reason? So it really was a curiosity project at first. And when people gave me their covers, I would hang them up. This is about how many I had when I decided to open it as a museum. And it really started as a party. It was invite my friends and neighbors, have some cupcakes because they have covers on them. I had the umbrella covers on the wall, and you can see each one of these has a story that goes with it. And it was just a festive time. I was open once a month in the summertime, and then the next year I opened it again. And pretty quickly, a friend of a friend who writes stories for NPR, Karen Michelle, heard about it, came out and did a piece about my little tiny museum on Sunday Weekend Edition. Well, then the BBC saw that I had a website and of course the British are very interested in umbrellas. It rains all the time. They use their umbrellas. And so BBC called me and I thought, wow, I guess I must really have something here because people are interested. So here's another view of some people. They're pointing to the umbrella cover that they donated with kitty cats on it. This is one of my interactive exhibits. I have a lot of um, games people can play. This one's for kids to match up the animal umbrella cover with the picture. And I do catalog them all. After a few couple years, I realized if I didn't write down and tag every umbrella cover, I would never remember who they all came from. Um, I actually was asked to speak at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte about the question, is categorization something we impose or is it a natural phenomenon? Are, are there naturally divided species, genres, races, or is that all a human construction? So I have to say, um, in case of umbrella covers, pun intended, um, it's really up to the curator how they're divided. So 
So here's another view of the museum. There's a timeline of the history of the umbrella, which goes back thousands of years. Uh, in the upper right, you can see a little black construction with an arch there. That is Stonehenge made out of umbrella covers. Yeah, so um, I had a lot of plain black ones. Of course, they do each have a story, but that's a, one of the things I've done. And on the left, under Queen Elizabeth's picture and a little moment of sadness for her husband, Philip, who died recently. There's an exhibit um, called Mad for Plaid, which is another game people play. Guess which one really came from Scotland of all those plaid umbrella covers? There's only one. So the fact that, that plaid is popular around the world, that we can all relate to umbrella covers, is kind of an international coming together of cultures. So here you see a couple of the specific umbrella covers that I have in the museum. Is my view of people on the side, can you see that? Is that in the way? Yes, I'm going to get that out of the way. So I'm sorry about that. So I want you to see the whole picture there. Okay, so that's my friend Josephine and a friend of hers showing you the map of the world where all of the umbrella covers come from. Now 73 different countries, which really relates to our principle of the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Because I use it to say there's something in common around the world, even if it's something as silly and simple as umbrella covers. Everyone can relate to these. And they can be the same in one country or different, but everyone can relate to them. So here are some visitors. Families love to come to my museum and everybody wins a prize. So they're holding up the little tiny drink parasols. Those are the prizes. And it started out where if you won the game, say Mad for Plaid, you found the Scottish cover, I would give you a prize. Well, then the brothers and sisters wanted prizes too. So I gave them prizes. Then the grown-ups started saying, oh, I want one. So, so I realized that it's just another commonality. Everybody loves to win a prize. And we don't judge people. I try to keep people from being highly competitive because, okay, here's your prize, here's your prize, here's your prize. It's a really kind of an equalizer at the museum that everybody can do the games, everybody can appreciate the umbrella covers. And our motto is celebrate the mundane. So the ordinary things in life can be joyful, like the first quote from Richard Feynman said, you can just look deeply into anything and it becomes interesting. And also it's not a museum about famous people. It's about ordinary people donating their umbrella covers, wanting to be part of this collection, telling me their story, and everyone is unique. So I really love that too. Here's a group of visitors. Sometimes I get that many people in this little space. So we're almost at the other end of the space where this camera is. And they're actually singing our theme song. You can see a few maracas there. I pass out little maracas. People can shake along. Um, and um, we'll do that at the end of my virtual tour here. So you get to enjoy that too. Here are a couple of great international donations. This is the Russian and Finnish covers. So the couple on the left, Terry and Ruth Moore, were in Russia. Terry's brother is on my board of trustees, also known as my board of troublemakers. So I found out he was in Russia. I said, Michael, please text Terry and say, maybe you could get a good Russian cover. So they got this Russian matryoshka or babushka doll type umbrella cover. I didn't get the umbrella and I don't want the umbrellas. I'm really more fascinated with the covers, although I do have quite a few umbrellas, and in certain cases I will uh, accept them. Helena on the right is from Finland, and there she is donating her personal umbrella cover, and then she sent me another very special one. After a while, I realized there was more to my museum than met the eye, and I created a mission statement. Here it is. I'm just going to move this little thing out of the way to... The Umbrella Cover Museum is dedicated to the appreciation of the mundane in everyday life. It is about finding wonder and beauty 
in the simplest of things and about knowing that there is always a story behind the cover. So that is something that has really kept me going and really connects with a lot of people. It's been written about. I usually make people read it out loud. I mean, I don't make them, but I ask them enthusiastically because it has a little more presence, a little more pizzazz. Um, on the left, you'll see an Aboriginal dot painting style dream time umbrella cover from Australia. And there's the special finish one. They're called Moomin Trolls and they're a book and a cartoon series from Finland and Sweden. Here's my intern, Gage, pointing out the smallest cover in the museum. It's a Barbie doll umbrella cover. She's holding a little tiny fake umbrella with a green cover on it. I do have interns, and two of my interns, here you see Ellie and Noah Kim, who have worked with me since they were this old. They're now in their 20s, and Ellie just put up my new website. Noah, when he was young, said, you should try for the Guinness World Record. So we went down to the library where they had good Wi-Fi at the time, and we applied thinking, naturally, they led us into their Guinness World Record because who else is even trying? Wrong. They rejected my category because there was no category. They get 65,000 requests a year for a new category. So five years later, we tried again and got approval for a new category. Ta-da! We could count for the Guinness World Record. And here it is, 2012. We had to organize everything so that there were no duplicates and no handmade covers. We did it by color, by size, by design. We requested judges. They, they wanted an expert in my field, but there weren't too many other umbrella cover experts. So I asked museum professionals, and they're carefully making sure there are no duplicates. We had to film it, we had to record it, we had to catalog it, send off all the information, and ta-da! I got the Guinness World Record for the most umbrella covers, and that was 10 years ago. Funnily enough, no one has challenged me, so I'm still the world record holder. I try to be very current as well. I've had two political umbrella cover displays during two past election years, not this most recent one, and now our most recent exhibit is about climate change. The way it works is that the, the statements, which are on recycled cardboard, appropriately enough, um, need a finish to the sentence like the blue one next to the barometer there in the middle of the left hand side says one animal species affected by the melting ice cap is the what's that on there it's a polar bear on an umbrella cover they're all umbrella covers there's a little cactus talking about deserts on the right and at the very bottom it says we don't want humanity to end up like this which is a doll as in the Mexican Day of the Dead, I saw that you had a special Day of the Dead um, honoring the dead um, through your UU. This has a zipper on the back and it used to hold an umbrella. Well, it's a pretty grim ending, but it's all done with humor. And that's another thing about my museum is that it has a lot of humor. I mean, I love museums in general. I don't deny any acad academic part of museums or any seriousness of museums that has its place. My museum uses humor to engage people, and I find that that is really something that works, that keeps people interested, even if they're skeptical. There are a lot of skeptics, especially men, I have to say, who walk in and go, what is this all about? But if I can keep them hearing more and more and the humor going, they become uh, engaged. It's really a serious question. It's ironic. But can humor be taken seriously, or can humor be used for serious concerns? I definitely think that the answer is yes. So here we have another couple exhibits I just wanted to show you. We've got kid-friendly covers with a Harry Potter cover on the far right. We've got art and umbrella covers where you guess which ones are by Monet, perhaps by Mondrian or Tiffany Glass. These are all donated by people from all over the world, and they all have a story. Okay, there are sexy covers. 
If you open the little the door to the little back room, which is also the bathroom, I call it the museum annex, there are sexy covers. What could be sexy? Well, okay, umbrella covers do look like condoms. And the photograph in the lower right hand corner in the box is a picture of French condoms. So I keep that in a box with a few other really rude X-rated covers so that little kids are not tempted to look in there and go, Mommy, Daddy, what's this? No. But they can see if their parents let them in. The leopard skin style ones, there are fishnet stocking umbrella covers. You can see one hanging on the right. High heeled shoes on an umbrella cover. And Jan Connor donated the beautiful, shiny, hot pink umbrella cover that's on both of these displays. So there is, yeah, who knew? Sexy umbrella covers. This is my, was my dream, to take the show to England because of their appreciation. And I managed to raise funds over five years to go to Bristol, England for two weeks to this beautiful gallery, about four times larger than the space that I'm in in Maine. So I had to rebuild these exhibits. I carried them all over in two suitcases. A curator friend said, why don't you use the tops of umbrellas to fill up the space, which worked beautifully. I got volunteers in England to help me hang the exhibit. And that was really a special, um, special moment for my museum. Another special thing is that I'm now representing the state of Maine on the World Channel, which is the PBS online video uh, accumulation. And Barbara has done one very short five minute film about each, almost, they're almost done, of the 50 states. And he chose me and my museum to represent the state of Maine. There's also a lot on YouTube if you want to look it up or Google some of the interesting articles about my museum. And of course, through my website, umbrellacovermuseum.org, you can see links to all of this and learn more about my museum. What happened during COVID? I could not put two and a half people that's all I could have fit legally into my museum. So after two months of being really um, confused and distressed, someone loaned me a tent. The Lions Club on Peaks Island loaned me the property that I could put it on, and I redid the exhibits. I put them in plastic so they wouldn't get too warped or the ink wouldn't run. I made it very user-friendly so I didn't have to walk around with people and give them a tour. I put up signage saying stay six feet away, masks required, and there it is right on the bay. You can see a little glimpse of the bay in the back right hand side. And it ran for most of uh, all of August and a little bit of July and September. Almost a thousand people came to see my little quirky museum. It's gotten kind of famous as certainly as a place to view in New England and among other okay, slightly eccentric museums in the world. There's a family viewing my Guinness World Record and being very careful as they look through the museum. A sign there says six feet here, wait until people pass. There's a family getting ready to sing our theme song. One of the most interesting stories, I think, is with the blue umbrella cover on the left that has a yellow fish embroidered on it. It's from the country of Benin in Africa. And uh, interestingly, there's a kingdom called the Dahomey Kingdom, which still exists, where every time they initiate a king, they build a new castle, they hold an umbrella that looks like this cover over the king's head. Sadly, the extra part of the story is that this is the country from which millions of slaves were taken from Africa, and many times the local people were the ones that captured their other citizens, brought them to this place where they were then taken away by European and American slave traders. So that's one of the more serious stories that goes with my museum. And I like the fact that it is educational, particularly about places around the world. Here's another coup that we made this year, the smallest museum in St. Paul, which is a fire hose cabinet on the outside of a building, invited me to put my exhibit up. And that's where Jan Colner saw me um, doing my talk about the Umbrella Cover Museum and invited me to speak with you. It's, um, here's a close-up of this museum. It's curated and generally every month or two a different exhibit is put in here. 
you'll see the um banana, the yellow thing on the right, and there's a wine bottle umbrella and cover. Now in both of those cases, I really needed to include the umbrella because otherwise they wouldn't look right. So those are, you know, instances where I do have the umbrella and the umbrella cover, and that's a facsimile of the Guinness World Record on the left. So I think that after all of this, I mean, there's a lot more that I've thought about with regards to umbrella covers, but that all of this does relate to principle number four, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Who knew it could come via umbrella covers? <laughs> um, here's another group ready to play our theme song. And I think it's almost time for you to join me in playing our theme song. I'll be glad to take questions and comments at the end. But first, I want to thank very, very much Randy, Mary, Andy, Diane for putting on what a beautiful service you do. It's so helpful, informative, and we did a great um, run through yesterday. And especially my dear friend and fellow musical cohort, Jan Colner for inviting me to be here today. So this one I'm gonna put up the words for you. We'll sing it through twice and I'll get my accordion back on. So we have musical accompaniment. I'm gonna write this song. You might recognize it from the 20s. It was one of those songs written by people in Tin Pan Alley to sell music and pianos. And it, it just grabbed me as the right attitude for my museum. <laughs> Just let a smile be your umbrella on a rainy, rainy day. And if your sweetie cries, just tell her that a smile will always pay. Whenever skies are gray, don't worry or fret. A smile will bring the sunshine and you'll never get wet. So let a smile be your umbrella on a rainy, rainy day. Day. One more time, just let us be your umbrella on a rainy, rainy day. Sing along, and if your sweetie cries, just tell him that a smile will always pay. Whenever skies are gray, don't worry or fret, a smile will bring the sunshine and you'll never get wet. So let us smile be your umbrella on a Rainy day. <laughs> All right. I see a few smiles out there. I'm really glad. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy.